Hi, welcome to ES301 Engineering Analysis. This is Chapter 17, Least Squares Regression, Part 2. So here are the learning goals for this video. At the end, you'll be able to linearize some nonlinear relationships. You'll be able to perform polynomial regression, and you'll know how to set up and solve a matrix solution for multiple or multidimensional linear regressions. All right. So in the previous video, we looked at, at doing least squares regression, and we found out how to quantify the error. And now I want to start looking at some more complicated regressions that we can still do linearly in the end. Um, but what we need to do is, is first sort of linearize those equations. So first I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to kind of use an example of a case where this might occur. Um, so here we, what I show is this, on the right here is this cup of coffee, um, and it's cooling off by natural convection. So the picture above here would be, for example, an IR image if I was to look at the surface of the coffee. And so it's going to cool off at some finite rate. Um, if we were to go ahead and blow on it gently, we know that we would cool it off a little bit faster. If there was like a large, say, industrial fan on it, it, could, it would cool off even faster. And so that rate at which it is being cooled off is characterized by something called the heat transfer coefficient. This is a pretty common thing that comes up in engineering. And so here's the equation. You might have seen this in heat transfer or in thermodynamics where the rate of heat transfer, this is Q dot, is proportional to the area that's exposed for heat transfer. So in this case, that would be the surface area of the coffee. And then this T minus T infinity, this is the temperature of the coffee is T, and T infinity is the temperature of the air that's being blown across. And this proportionality constant is H, and it's called the heat transfer coefficient. And it characterizes the fluid that is doing the cooling, so in this case, the type of air that is being blown on the coffee, um, it also characterizes the velocity of it as well, um, and even some flow dynamics. It's a fairly complicated function. But normally, because of that, what we do is we just experimentally measure what that is. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and solve this equation up here, well, Q dot, that is, we know from thermodynamics, that's going to be the mass of the coffee, heat capacity of the coffee, and then this is a rate, so it's going to be dt dt, the change in temperature with time. That's what is Q dot. So if I go ahead and look at what results, as I have... A differential equation in temperature because I have a dt on the left and a t on the right. So in order to solve this, I can integrate this equation and apply one boundary condition, or what in this case would be considered an initial condition because I'm integrating with time. So I'd say, well, t is some initial temperature of the coffee, t naught at time, t zero. So I could go ahead and solve this equation. Um, and what I would see if I was to go ahead and con uh, conduct the experiment, if I was to measure the temperature, so this would be the temperature on the left hand side. This would be as a function of time. This might be the temperature as I measure on the coffee, so I just put a thermometer in there. Initially, it would cool off fairly quickly, and then it would slowly um, cool off slower and slower and slower. So it's going to start off at a temperature of T0, and it's going to be approaching its at infinite time some temperature, which would be in T infinity, which is the temperature of the air. And as I said, if we were to go ahead and solve this differential equation, this is what it would look like, and, and apply the boundary conditions. On the left-hand side, I have this ratio of t minus t infinity over t naught minus t infinity. So there's my temperature that I'm measuring. And then I've got an exponential term where it's minus t over tau. And tau is a group of parameters. And this is grouping that I show right below it, which is ha divided by mc. So it's, that gives me the heat transfer coefficient and as well as some characteristics of the coffee of the actual experiment that I'm doing. But what I want to get is this value of h. Now, as we see this plot that I have, it looks like this. It's this exponential decay. It's not linear not linear in time, and so what I need to do is linearize the equation. So what you can do, you might be able to look at this, if I was to go ahead and take, for example, the natural log of both sides of this equation, what I would end up having on the left-hand side would be the natural log of t minus t infinity over t naught minus t infinity, and then I'm going to take the natural log of the right-hand side, natural log of an exponential, those effectively kind of cancel out, and so I'll end up with just minus t over tau. And so if I look at this equation now, what I realize is now I've got a linear equation I have in time. I have a slope of minus 1 over tau if I was going to do a plot of the natural log of this temperature instead of plotting the temperature. So if I were to do that, it would look something like this. So I've got natural log of that term right there, and I'm plotting that as a function of time. And it would be linear, and it would start up over here at a value of 1, which would happen to occur at time 0. And it would be more or less linear. Obviously, there's going to be some scatter of the data points. And then that slope of that line right over there is just going to be minus 1 over tau, which is minus mc over ha. So if I in my experiment, I measure the mass and heat capacity of the coffee and the cross-sectional area. From this slope, I could go ahead and give it h. So here's an example of where I could go ahead 
and we want to linearize this equation and then go ahead and do a linear uh, least square regression. Um, so this next slide, I just show some, some common linearizations, and so I'll just kind of review it. This is a figure from the textbook. So this first one that we show up in the top, this is the nonlinear relationship. This is similar to what we just had, where we had an exponential term. Here, the independent variable is x. In the previous example, it was t. And then if I go down to the bottom here, what you realize is that I can go ahead and linearize it by, as they show here, taking the natural log of both sides. I have the natural log of y. And then that natural log and exponential term effectively cancels out the function of x, where the slope in this case is beta. So in this middle case, now I have y is equal to, and now I don't have an exponential of x. It's x taken to a power beta 2. But again, that's not going to be linear in that term. But if I now take the log of both sides, and so here we're just going to take the log base 10 of both sides, I end up with this linear relationship I show on the bottom. And let's go and just look at this, this final example up here. This one clearly is, is not um, as obvious that you could linearize it, because now I've got x over beta 3 plus x, and so it might not be clear what I could do to go ahead and linearize it. And the key is, if I was to take the reciprocal of this, so I'd end up with now, I'm going to end up with minus 1, or sorry, not minus, but just 1 over y, and it's going to be 1 over alpha 3. And now I've got beta 3 plus x over x, and that's essentially going to be beta 3 plus 1. So now I've got my slope if I was to plot it over um, 1 over x. So that's what we see here on the bottom. I'm plotting 1 over y versus 1 over x, and there's my slope. So usually just take some kind of fiddling around and, and uh, creativity, but you can often find common linearizations for equations that look like this. And then you can go ahead and do your least squares regression. Let's keep looking at some more complicated regression. I mean, so each time I'm going to try to show kind of a typical example where this might arise. And so this is another one kind of from the field of, of thermodynamics, um, where this plot I show over on the right is a value of the heat capacity um, as a function of temperature over a very large range. This is over thousands of degrees. And if you've taken a thermodynamics class, you might be familiar with the fact that for some molecules, this relationship can be highly nonlinear. The heat capacity is a strong function of temperature. So on the bottom, I show where it's not really a function of temperature. This is for the noble gases. However, as the molecules become, I think, a bit more complicated, there's more elements to it, um, and they become more polar, I end up with something that is a higher um, function of temperature. So for example, look at carbon dioxide up here. It's highly nonlinear. It changes by a factor of two over the course of a couple thousand degrees. And there's also a lot of curvature to it. This isn't very linear. But what you might want is to have a relationship so you can determine what the heat capacity is at any temperature just by making a few measurements. What we'd have to do is make some measurements and then go ahead and effectively curve fit to that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to curve fit to some sort of polynomial. And so here's a polynomial that tends to work pretty well. Um, and this is often used where the heat capacity is going to be some constant. And then I'm just going to go ahead and do increasing powers of the temperature. Temperature to 1, 2 and 3 power. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and get parameters for A, B, C, and D. And kind of in the more general case when we've been looking at these things in, in the class, right, we've had Y is some function of the independent variable X, and then I've got my constants A0, A1, etc. So that or X in this case corresponds to the temperature. So what I need to do is determine what those four constants are. And so what we do is it's very similar to what we did before when we did linear least squares regression. Is we can go ahead and define what this Error is this value of S sub R, which is my experimentally determined value minus what my model is, which is this A naught and then A1x, etc. And then remember, I want to go ahead and square it, and I want to minimize that. So what am I going to do? Well, you might remember. What I do is I do the partial derivative. So I'm going to do DSR A, or sorry, DSR over DA0, set that equal to 0. Um, and then I can do it for each one of these. So DSR DA1, and I can go ahead and do that all the way down to DSR d a sub 3. And so what I'm going to end up with is going to be four equations, all of them set equal to 0, and then I can go ahead and just solve what those values of a are, a sub i, for example, in each one of these. And so this comes out to be a, a matrix equation because because of this squared term, when I do these partial derivatives, each one of these, all of these terms over here, are going to be functions of all these parameters, of a0 and a1 and a2, etc. And so I end up with this sort of matrix equation where I've got all these terms in here. I'm trying to determine what is a sub i. And that right over there is going to be equal to some constant value. If you do this partial derivative, you will end up with some constant value that you put on the right-hand side. But you can go ahead and solve it. And we've seen how to solve these matrix equations. 
Um, before I do an example, or, or actually, no, let's go ahead and do an example for this one, sorry. Um, and we'll go ahead and push this through. So here what I have is, again, from a, a thermodynamics textbook, the value of the heat capacity as a function of temperature, and this is for carbon dioxide. So let's go ahead and curve fit this to the equation that I had before, which is going to be A plus BT plus CT squared plus DT cubed. So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, that polynomial. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this in MATLAB. So first I'm going to define my, my heat capacity value. So I'm just going to take those out of the table and put them into a vector. And then I'm going to go ahead and, and create another vector, which is my temperature. Most of those values are about every 50 degrees, except at the end, they're just every 100. And so now I've got my values of CP as a function of temperature. And then what I want to do is I want to essentially determine what that polynomial is. And MATLAB has a good function that does it. It's called polyfit. So if you go ahead and do help polyfit, it tells you how to do that. And you look down here, the polyfit equation takes a vector of x and y values, and you also tell it to tell the order of the polynomial that you want. And so if it's degree n, it's going to return n plus 1 constants. So that tells me if n was equal to 1, for example, that would be a0 plus a1x is the polynomial that I'm fitting it to. So if I look up here, what do I want? Well, I want a third order polynomial because I'm going to want this as a function of temperature. All right. So let's go ahead and, and do that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just change the format so that we can look at these numbers. Some of them tend to be small. And now I'm using the function polyfit, telling it that it's a third order polynomial. Um, and it's being returned in this vector p. So these are my parameters p. Another thing to note is that the, the highest value or the highest order is returned first. So it's really small value, e to the minus 10. That one right over there would be my a sub 3 value or the b value in, in the notation that I used before. That's thing that's going to be time t cubed. And the next one's the one that's going to be time t squared, etc. Okay. Um, so now what I'm going to do is, let's say I want to determine it at a particular value. I want to determine it, I don't know, say that we're going to determine it, say 425, which is in the middle. I want to evaluate the polynomial I just had. And again, MATLAB has a nice function that does it. It's called polyval. And here I send it the polynomial I just created, polynomial coefficients, which is p, and then the x value, which is the one that I wanted to determine the value at. So for example, let's go ahead and do it and find out what the heat capacity is at um, a value of t of equal to 425. If I do it, I have this value here, which is 0 0.958. And if I come over and look at my table, I was doing it over here at 425. And so 425, you know, 958 sure looks like it's right about in the middle there. So I went ahead and determined the value I want. So the polynomial p contains all the coefficients. And you can actually compress those two steps into one, where I'm going to go ahead and do polyfit. It's going to go ahead and return a polynomial. And not even have to bother calling it p, I'm just going to go ahead and send it back to polyval. This would be good if you're just doing this once to go ahead and get the same value. So that's how you go ahead and, and do polynomial regression in MATLAB, and you don't have to bother evaluating all those parts of the derivative. All right, so at the end here, I want to look at, at even a little bit more complicated, which is now let's look at multidimensional um, linear regression. So, for example, here I have some sort of function that is a function of both, oh, let's say, parameters x1 and x2. And this is my value y, and it's got some sort of curvature here. If I now want to fit this entire surface, um, I could do that with a linear term. Linear meaning they're linear in the values of a. And now I've got my x1 and my x2 values, and then I might have x1 squared and x2 squared, etc., etc., etc. And I want to go and determine what are the values of a sub i. And so how would I do that? Well, I'm sure you guessed it at this point. What I'm just going to do is take the partial derivatives of dsr v a sub i each time, right? So remember, oops, sorry, I didn't need to write on top of that. We'll go ahead and, and uh, raise that. Okay, so here's the value of sr that you normally see. And so this is what I'm going to go ahead and take the partial derivative of, the v s r d a 0, um, set that equal to 0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to do it for each one of those a sub i's. And what you should realize is each time you're going to have one equation for each unknown that you need to determine. So no matter how high order of a polynomial you, it, you have, you can always go ahead and solve the equation. So one thing I want to point out, um, and this is, this is what the matrix looks like if I had just maybe the first three parameters, A1, uh, or A0 through A2. The thing to note here, um, this is from the book, but you don't need to memorize this as much as notice that everything in the matrix is a bunch of summations of all the x values, and over on the right, I have a summation of some x values times my y value 
But effectively what I'm doing is I'm just summing up all the data points that I have. I'm looking at all the points on this surface, for example, and I'm using those to go ahead and curve it, which, which makes some sense. But that's what appears in here is just some summation of all of that data. And as I add more and more data to it, I'm going to have a somewhat different curve. And that becomes important for kind of this next topic I'm going to talk about, which is how to do this numerically with least squares fitting. So um, remember, again, my matrix, this little diagram on the upper right is just to remind you, those matrices just tend to be a whole bunch of summations. And let's look at a, a, another concrete example, once again, from the field of thermodynamics, where here I've got this uh, parameter S, which is the entropy, and it's a function of pressure and temperature. So if you take in thermodynamics, you might know that. But if not, you just recognize this is my two to, or my um, uh, function that's a, um, this function S is a function of two independent parameters. Uh, like x1 and x2 are the pressure and the temperature. And so, so let's say I wanted to go ahead and fit this complicated curve. And you realize this is pretty complicated. I've got this phase change region in here where things are somewhat steep and then it kind of get out into this uh, more mundane region. It's a fairly complicated function. And if I wanted to fit that, well, I might use and find some polynomial. Let's say I'm going to attempt to fit it to this. So I've got as functions, linear functions of temperature and pressure pressure and temperature squared. I've got a cross term pressure times temperature. Um, and I could go ahead and keep adding more and more complicated ones. I could do maybe the log of the temperature, anything that I want, as long as it's linear in my value of a sub i. And so if I want to determine what that is, right, you could do all those partial derivatives. But there's some interesting matrix math that you can do. And I'm not going to review it here. It's not something you really need to be responsible for in the class. Just recognize that it exists. You can look at the proof in the textbook. But more or less, what's going to end up happening, remember each time you have this matrix, it's a function of all these summation values. And then we're multiplying that by our a sub i values, and that's being equal to some sort of constant that results, which again is a function of a bunch of summation values. And so what you're solving every time is this matrix equation, there's this general form here. I'm trying to find the vector a. These are my values my, um, that I'm doing measurements. So this would be, for example, entropy, the s value in the example I have. And then I've got this Z matrix. And this Z matrix is going to be built up of all the measurements that I have, of all the data points that I have. So for example, imagine I, I had my table that generated this curve here where at each pressure and temperature I have a value of the entropy. And this is some really, really long table that generates this entire complicated graph that I have. Okay? Each one of these S values is going to be the value of one of those elements of Y. And then what I'm doing is this vector Z or sorry, this matrix Z is just going to be all of these um, independent parameters, pressure and temperature, taken to these various powers that I have in the equation that I'm trying to fit. All right, this is probably best shown with an example. So let's go ahead and push through the example that I have. So, um, for example, let's go ahead and fit our value, our, um, fit our parameter entropy S. And we're going to do it to this complicated function I have here where I have five con or six constants, A0, 3, 5, that I want to find. And I have a plot of it here, and just to kind of make this manageable, I, I resist myself to just 16 points here. And these are the 16 points that I have of my value of entropy. In reality, you might have hundreds or even thousands of parent, uh, data points that you're trying to pick. Okay? And we want to go ahead and determine what are the values of A sub I. We'll do this in MATLAB. So first, I'll just go ahead and load in my pressure, my temperature, and my entropy data. And say I have it in three different data files that I have loaded there. Um, if I was going to just do a surface plot, which is what I show on the right-hand side, I could just do a surface plot like this. And now here's kind of the key. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create that z vector. And that z vector I'm taking is go and look at your equation that I have. So go over and look at the equation. Right? And I've got my a naught, that's a constant value, temperature to the one power, pressure to the one power, then a cross term of pressure temperature. So if I come back over here and look at z, here's this this matrix I have. This isn't a square matrix. This is actually rectangular. It's going to be essentially one row for every data point. This value of C is just a bunch of ones because that's going to be multiplied by A naught. So one times A naught is just A naught. That gives me my constant value. Then the A1 is the temperature and the pressure. And then there's my cross term of temperature and pressure. And so realize those are all more or less the parameters that come after the coefficients in my equation. All right, so now I've built up my Z matrix. And in this case, it's going to be three elements, or sorry, it's going to be five elements, six elements across. Um, and then it's going to have the 16 points long. And I'm just going to go ahead and solve it. So I'm going to use that um, slash operator in MATLAB to go ahead and solve for my values of A. And then here it is. And MATLAB just spits it out to me, gives me what my values of A are. And in this case, that very first one, that's my A naught value. 
um, which in, in this uh, plot that I have over here is, is that constant value that I have. That one right over there is A1, and this one right over here is you know, a value of A5, which is the one that was multiplied by T to the fifth, for example. Right? So let's go ahead and see how well this fit works. So what I'm going to do is just um, evaluate what entropy would be according to my model. So I'm calling that S3 here. Um, and then I'm using, there's my A sub 1, because MATLAB's index started 1. That right over there is the A0 value in my um, equation that I show. And then I'm just going to multiply this by my values of temperature and pressure. All right. Um, you can ignore the fact that I call it T2. I just went ahead and, and uh, renamed it there before I, I did this. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and just plot this, and I'm going to plot all those data points in a model with little red stars. If I do it, if you look over here, um, it actually just falls, looks like it right, falls right on the surface, and it does an amazing fit. And the reason for that is it fits so amazingly well that I'm only using 16 points and I'm using these six parameters. Normally, you would, the fit wouldn't be this good if you had hundreds of thousands of data points, but you get the idea it does pretty well. And so it goes ahead and fits to any arbitrary function that you want. So you can go ahead and pick the function you want. You can have lots of cross terms and higher order powers. And the more values you put in there, the better it will probably fit. And if it doesn't need that parameter, it'll have to set a value of the A that says it's going to be pretty close to zero. All right, so let's go ahead and review what we talked about in this video. Um, what we saw is that there's many relationships that are nonlinear, but they can be linearized through some simple algebra. Um, and then you can go ahead and just do a regular least squares regression on that. Um, you can do a polynomial least squares regression. It involves just more parameters of these values of a sub i, but you can determine those just by taking the partial derivative of this sr value each time for each parameter a and sending it to zero. Um, and then we also saw you can have really complicated multidimensional least squares regression. You can have a lot of complicated terms and cross terms, um, but you can go ahead and solve this with just some matrix algebra, um, and then you're just going to go ahead and use all of your data values to stick it into, into this rectangular matrix, which is called z, and solve for your parameters a sub i.